Hello, pilots and flight instructors. This is John Niehaus, Director of Program Development for the National Association of Flight Instructors, welcoming you back to another episode of the Naffy Moore Right Rudder Podcast, the podcast for flight instructors on the go. And today's episode is actually sponsored by our friends at King Schools. Now, if you're not familiar with King Schools, and I'm sure that you are, the they are a training organization that provides training materials and supplies and know-how to pilots. And John and Martha King have been a staple of aviation education for a very, 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 very long time. And they actually just released a book, and you can kind of hear how it came to be and some of the business ventures that they had prior to starting King Schools and uh, and then how they eventually settled on aviation education. Their educational materials are second to none, and NAFI members actually have access to several of their digital courses. And so if you're interested, you can go to nafinet.org. Check out the courses. If you're not a member, join so you can have access to the courses. And then, of course, you get a discount for the CFI Renewal Program that they have, the FERC. And there's also a training scholarship, a CFI scholarship that is a, a partnership between NAFI and King Schools. And that goes out every year. So they usually will release it, uh, I think, early in each year. And then by sun and fun, they will make the announcement as to who receives the scholarship. So very generous of them to support NAFI and NAFI members. And of course, we thank them for all of their support. So thank you, King Schools, and check them out. So anyways, today's podcast, you're just going to have to listen to me, and I apologize in advance for that. But uh, one of the things I came across the other day was a tips for successful CFI check ride compliments of NAFI. And this is something that uh, we actually provide to students who are getting ready for their CFI check ride. And this is something that we provide. We are have a partnership with ATP and uh, their CFI applicants will receive this checklist and we hope that it helps and I hope it maybe helps you as well. So I figure we could just kind of go down the list here and some of these things we'll uh, we'll talk about. Some of these things may be somewhat self-explanatory, but uh, tips for a successful CFI check ride. So the first one we've got here, testing on how to teach, not how to fly. So it says, get into the role. You must demonstrate to the FA that you are a teacher, and all teachers use a whiteboard. Well, okay, maybe you also make do with a piece of paper. But the best tool for a good teacher is a drawing platform. You know that students retain 85% of what they hear and see, so show them in a drawing. You must draw to te- and teach efficiently. So this is interesting, because <laughs> nowhere in here does it say you must draw well. So I know a lot of people out there will say, well, I'm not an artist. What am I supposed to do? I can tell you that most of my airplanes that I draw, they're not good. They're not good at all. And it doesn't matter. Students don't care. You have a good laugh about it. I had a student when I was teaching at a 141 university. (laughs) It became a joke because I would always teach drag, and whenever we'd talk about the different types of drag, I'd draw different types of concept airplanes. And one of them I would always call the Honda element of airplanes. And essentially, it was basically just a big, giant box with wings. And we'd talk about why this thing is just nothing but drag. And then we would change it up with, okay, well, what if it's made of this substance or that substance? What if I put concrete, uh, make the outside concrete or sandpaper or whatever it might be? So... If you're concerned about how well your drawing is, get over it. Nobody cares. So just know that drawing pictures is important. That same student, I also found out, had a bit of a um, a small learning disability. And what we found out was that because of that disability, this individual learned way better with drawing. And so I learned to not just get over myself, But I also learned how to change the way I teach so that I could use more pictures. And if I couldn't draw it, I found pictures online or I found 
uh, computer models, videos, any other thing. And it just forces you to come at it from a different angle. And you could start out by teaching somebody, well, I'm going to write out bullet points, and that's okay, a little boring, but okay. Um, but make sure you have this in your back pocket because not everybody's going to take that and learn from it. So very good tip. Next one. You're not there to demonstrate your ability to pilot an airplane. The commercial pilot certificate already proved uh, that you can fly to commercial pilot standards. So there's no excuse for being unable to do so. The flight instructor practical test is a test on the applicant's ability to teach to the said levels, private, instrument, commercial. Well, maybe not instrument, but you get the idea. Be ready to talk through each maneuver as you fly it and critique your own performance. The examiner may require you to teach a maneuver and then critique it as if the examiner was a private pilot, commercial student, uh, so on. And this one says, mine had me teach him lazy eights in addition to flying them myself. In fact, actually, I didn't, I don't think I actually wrote this, but that is exactly what I had to do. I had to teach and fly lazy eights for my examiner and, uh, yeah, they weren't perfect, but I think it's almost more effective to not be perfect. I'm not saying that on a check ride you don't want to be perfect, because you certainly want to be. But I think there's also an importance to knowing, hey, this one wasn't good. I can't tell you how many times after a while where maybe you didn't have any commercial students and you didn't have to do commercial maneuvers for a while, and you first go up with that student that that needs that type of training and you go, well, I haven't done these in six months. And you go and you try to fly a lazy eight and it's terrible. If you try to sell that off as well, there's, there's uh, this was good. This is how you're going to do it. They're going to learn from the very beginning that it wasn't correct. So being honest when you screw up as an instructor, when you're demonstrating, well, this is what I would do differently. Um, I think that that's, that's really important. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to examiners where the, instructor did not teach the student properly so the student goes and and actually does the maneuver exactly how they were taught okay so you perfected the maneuver the wrong way is that the student's fault or is that the instructor's fault it's exactly the the instructor's fault uh the examiner certainly can't pass a maneuver that is incorrect but it's kind of a sad day because the student really didn't do anything wrong at that point so be honest with yourself and be honest with your student. Same thing goes for when you're talking about things on the ground. Don't ever make anything up. You guys know this. Um, it's important to be honest. Oh, man, I forgot this. Let's look it up together. So moving on, let's see here. Demonstrate you can teach ADM and beyond. Be very proficient at teaching aeronautical decision-making principles and how to incorporate them into flight. So what does this actually mean? I was talking with a friend of mine um, at uh, American Bonanza Society, and we were talking about the idea of ADM in, in uh, aviation and how one of the disservices we as instructors do to our students is we take over, right? We make sure that they make the right decisions. And of course, that's important. We want to make sure that nobody does anything unsafe. But at the same time, how far do we let it go? Okay? On a check ride, an examiner has to test ADM for a student. How do they do that? Well, you've all heard stories of, well, it's really gusty out, or maybe it's marginal VFR. And the student is gung-ho to get the check ride done so okay can we go do commercial maneuvers when it's 1500 overcast well let's find out so you let the student pre-flight you let the student come back get the examiner ready to go yep okay get into the airplane you sure yep oh i'm sorry well you just failed your your check ride well why because you didn't display good aeronautical decision making. So as instructors, how do we teach this? We have to figure out where the end of that rope is, right? We have to let them make decisions right up onto the point where you have to step in and say, this is not the right choice. Certainly always keep safety in mind, 
But it's the same thing where if you always correct a student's maneuver, if you always correct their landing at the last moment, how are they going to learn to land? If you never give them the opportunity to make the wrong choice, how are they going to know how to make the right choice? Especially when it becomes a situation where they're by themselves, they're soloing, they're, uh, they've earned their private pilot certificate, and there's nobody there to tell them, hey, this is a bad idea. So make sure that you, as a future instructor, and for all those who are already instructors out there that are listening, you know, if you haven't incorporated ADM, make it a big deal for your students. Develop a list of issues, maneuvers, tasks, information that are not part of the ACS or PTS. And be able to explain that there is much more to the student for the student to learn beyond the ACS PTS. Okay. I think that's interesting because essentially that's what we've done at NAFI with the professional development program. And I'm not going to give you the, the whole spiel right here, although I highly encourage you, if you are NAFI members, to go check out the professional development program, 30 courses. Um, and the concept for the 30 courses was all of the things that instructors need to know that aren't on the PTS. Things like leadership skills, communication skills, and in other sort of more obvious instructional skills, but to a actionable step degree uh aviation weather rules of thumb you're not going to be tested necessarily on all of the the different types of weather you may be asked about charts and stuff like that but if i go outside and look up and and see a certain kind of cloud well, what does that mean for me that's not in the pts that's not in the far's it's not in any of the other manuals it might be in the aviation weather manual the advisory circular but so think of those things what are the things that when that instructor shows up on day one with their brand new student, their first student, what are they going to need to know? Well, what is that private pilot that you're teaching? What are they going to need to know beyond just stalls, steep turns, short field landings? Think about it. May not be in your check ride, but still worth doing. Be able to demonstrate the introduction of distractions how you'll teach ADM and risk management. I think we've all heard the story of the examiner who drops the pencil and asks you to pick it up. <laughs> I think I told all of my students, if they drop their pencil, have a pencil in your forward pocket and give them that one. And when they're disappointed that you didn't pick up the pencil and they drop that one, maybe you have another one in your pocket. It's the old adage of, well, what happens if your flashlight batteries die? Or what happens... If the batteries die on your digital E6B, well, you've got batteries after batteries. So it's kind of a, a cat and mouse game, but you get the idea. Figure out how to do distractions. I used to love uh, coming up with new ways to distract my students and figure out how they react. So have fun with it. Be unique. Don't do the same thing every time. Don't be predictable. So now we get into the oral exam. So during the oral portion of the test, don't hesitate to ask the examiner to clarify the subject of the question asked. Because of the examiner's dual hats worn, applicants are sometimes unsure of whether a question is asked in the role of a student or an examiner to test the applicant's underlying knowledge. Be sure to clarify. Um, doing so is not only critical to answer appropriately, but it could preclude starting down a path of misunderstanding that derails the whole check ride. I think this one's a little self-explanatory, uh, but I see what they're getting at here. I mean, if the examiner is bouncing between the role of your student over the role of the examiner, I guess I could see how that would be confusing. But really, I mean... Uh, Anytime you're in a check ride, if you don't understand the question, don't answer. And remember, the same thing that you have heard from the first day you walked into private pilot training is don't dig yourself a hole. Answer the question and answer only the question. If you're not sure of what that question is, then ask the question. And going back to something we previously mentioned already, if you don't know the answer, be honest. 
know where to find it. Obviously, you have a tabbed FAR, I hope. If you don't, you should. But know where to find these things. Bring books to your check ride. Make sure they're current. But bring books. They're not going to let you get away with that with every question, of course. But uh, um, I think that's important. Come extremely prepared. Some of these orals can be four to eight hours. Um, this person says, whoever wrote this, mine was nearly six hours long. Uh, me personally, I think six hours is actually about what mine was too. Once again, I didn't write that. I don't think, <laughs> but, uh, it does sound about right. It was a long day. I mean, you have the paperwork in the beginning, you've got the oral exam itself, and then in my case, I did uh, the flight portion in both a Cirrus SR20 and then had to change over to do the complex portion of it back when they, I don't think they require that anymore, but don't hold me to that, um, in an arrow. So it was two airplanes and a whole bunch of other stuff going on. So it was a long, long day. It was at least an eight-hour check ride. And uh, yeah, be ready. You have no idea what they might come up with, but you do the best you can. Have all of your reference beside you and use them as required. Huh. I guess I'm smarter than I thought because we already hit this one. It would be impossible to remember all of the answers to all possible questions on the test. Make sure you look it up. Be honest once again, um, and then have those resources available for you. Um, maybe even make sure you're prepared with bookmarks on an iPad. So if you wanted to bring up a video resource, make sure it's credible, but, uh, you know, it goes back to that being unique and making sure that you have different ways to teach different individuals. Next section, it says, be prepared. So keep your energy up. As a DPE, and this is a quote, as a DPE, I have seen applicants perform very well to a point and then they fall apart because they have run out of energy. When taking a knowledge test or a checkride, always get plenty of rest, which is difficult to do on checkride night. Have a high energy source handy in your pocket like a Snickers. It could save the day. You're not you without a Snickers. <laughs> Hershey's I'll uh, expect, or Mars Bar I'll expect a... Uh, royalties in a few days um but remember that the benefit of a candy can be short term so yeah I, I i don't know if i agree with a snickers although i suppose it could save the day um protein bars uh I'll, laura bars are what i keep in my flight bag um and my wife yells at me because i pronounce them incorrectly apparently but nevertheless something with the uh, high protein um nuts granola that type of thing that's going to help save the day for you if you're really starting to feel like, um, you know, you're lethargic. And on an eight-hour check ride, you're going to need something. Um, sometimes even examiners will take a break to have lunch or something. So make sure you're ready for something like that. Preparation and organization is key to being successful, a successful CFI. So it is a, a testament. Oh, that's weird. Um, during the CFI check ride. I don't know if that might be a typo. If you haven't yet, take the time to tag the important areas in the FAR and FAR, uh, AIM for quick access. We already talked about that. And in fact, uh, Lively Aviation is owned by a uh, friend of mine. I met, well, new friend of mine I met at AirVenture. And uh, they have a really unique product where they actually come up with all the tabbed things for you. You can order them from them. I don't get a kickback, I promise, but uh, he's a super nice guy and he's a small business owner. So, um, you know, I think uh, it's cool. So check them out at Lively Aviation. But anyways, tabbed FAR, tabbed um, AIM, even maybe tabbed advisory circulars. Bring a copy of 6165, and I don't know what they're up to, hotel or golf, and uh, make sure you've got all of those. Know your endorsements. There is a big, 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 big push for... Um, understanding how to endorse a student for a check ride because if that endorsement's not right that check ride can't happen so um they will most likely ask you a lot of questions on what that is so be prepared have it with you check out the naffy sporties endorsement guide sporties and naffy have partnered to uh to to 
make this resource. We've been doing it for a very, very long time, and Supporters has been kind enough to help us with it because so many changes have taken place in the last few years that we just could not keep up with it. So um, we appreciate Sporties for uh, taking that on, and of course they're a generous sponsor of Naffy as well. So um, more more training information and, and training stuff. I do, it's not on this list here. But a lot of people like to take shortcuts when it comes to creating training materials. If I have a CFI applicant and they say, hey, I'm going to go and buy a commercially available lesson plans book or, um, you know, I don't know, digital compendium, whatever that might look like, I'm not going to tell you not to do it. In fact, it might be some great materials that maybe you haven't thought of. But I don't believe uh, that it takes the place of putting in the work to create your own CFI binder. And maybe that's old school nowadays. But I can tell you that when you have to go through and find the information and know where, how to document where those things were, you're looking at four different books to teach aviation weather. You're going to learn something in that process. So when I have CFI students... They're going to do their own lesson plans. So make sure that you have those. And then you can bring that to the check ride. That can be tabbed out too so that you've got all the information. I know that my CFI binder was, gosh, it had to have been a good three or four inch binder that was just completely full of all of the materials I needed. But also, again, things like links that I could type in for uh, special videos or media content to make things interesting. I think I used to use, one of my favorites was, I would use the video for uh, rods and cones performed by the Blue Man Group to teach flight physiology. Because how else are you supposed to, as a non-medical student or non-medical professional, how are you supposed to teach how eyes work? Funny enough, the Blue Man Group, also not being medical professionals, do a great job with their music video. So you think your student's going to remember the Blue Man Group a lot more than you drawing out an eye on a whiteboard or just kind of reading like uh, the teacher from Ferris Bueller rods are in your eyes and you can see based on how much light. So anyways, <laughs> off my soapbox. But uh, so yeah, that's the list of things that we've got on here. And I, again, I know that it, some of it is, is surface level. Um, but, uh, the goal of all of this is to get you to think it's to get you to read in between the lines because you can never put down everything you're ever going to possibly need for a check, right? But what it does is makes you kind of dig a little deeper. Oh, ADM. Well, what does that mean? Oh, if I'm going to teach ADM, what kinds of situations can I come up with? And scenario-based training is such a big deal nowadays, and you're going to have to create these scenarios. So what am I going to do? Oh, let's talk about a high wind day. Are we going to go and try to practice short field landings with a high crosswind wind, or even, frankly, even just a high wind in general? As a CFI, you're concerned about maybe how many hours you're trying to get. Don't be one of those instructors don't be one of those that just is about the hours maybe you are teaching to to move on to another job a regional or whatever that's perfectly okay and don't ever ever let anybody tell you it's not everybody has to start somewhere and everybody has aspirations in mind however be the instructor that everyone else looks up to do the job and do it to the best of your ability and whether that's for a year, three years, six months. Somebody's going to walk away and go, this person did the best they could and they taught me very well. So when it comes to things like, can we go fly? Sure we could. Should we? Is this student going to learn something if we go and do steep turns on a very windy turbulent day yeah you're going to get an hour and a half of flight training out of it you're going to put that in your logbook they're going to put that in their logbook but ultimately what did you accomplish nothing that student's going to learn a lot more if you say look this is what the weather conditions are should we go what do you think 
And if they say yes, we should go. Educate them. That's what your job is. Your job is to educate them. Just like a parent. Sometimes the best parenting skills are saying no. Sometimes the best CFIs say no. So with that, that's all I got. It's a little bit of a shorter episode this week. We're still edging closer to our 60th episode, and that is the uh, celebration episode we pushed back from the 50th. And I have some good plans for that, so stay tuned. But um, I know we didn't cover everything. What What do you think we missed? <clears throat> what do you think should be added to this list? If you're a CFI or a future CFI, let us know. Comment. Uh, send us messages. Naffy at naffynet.org is our email address. You can go to our Facebook page and you can comment there. We have a uh, Facebook group, so there's actually two pages. There's the 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 business page and then there's a discussion group. If you're not part of the discussion group, go find us there. It's a great place to comment about things like this, but it's also a great place to ask questions. If you're a CFI, especially a new CFI, and, and you're not sure about how this should work or what regulation you should source or can you do this, is this legal? I'm there, I'm there and I've got a couple thousand of my close friends that can help answer those questions for you. Become a NAFI member if you're not already. NAFI at NAFI. No, that's our email. NAFINet.org. Uh, you can sign up that way and you can get a hold of all of those resources that we talked about for King Schools, but also discounts for many others. You can get a discount for ForeFlight and uh, for Cloud Ahoy, which is a great instructional resource. Go to your check ride with Cloud Ahoy and you're going to really impress that examiner. So anyways, if you've got ideas, if you want to add to this, let me know. Maybe even go to our CFIs Teaching CFIs Special Interest Group, which is hosted by our uh, Chairman Emeritus, Bob Mater. Lots of cool stuff. So anyways, thanks for listening. I hope you're enjoying this, uh, this podcast as a whole. Subscribe for anywhere you listen to podcasts. Find us on social media, comment, reach out, and join Naffy. Thank you so much.